Good afternoon. Welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists webinar series. Um, all 49 of you, we're glad you could join us today. My name is Louis Mantini. I'm pleased to be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm an environmental scientist and I work for the Suwannee River Water Management District in Live Oak, Florida. And I've been with the SWS webinar committee since 2017. We're very excited to share this SWS e-learning experience today for all of you to stay engaged virtually and earn continuing education credits. Today's lecture and topic will be conservation planning in municipalities, case studies of urban wetlands and waterways. And it is our pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Rhonda Burnett. Rhonda is a community conservation planner, planner for the Missouri Department of Conservation and provides statewide service from her regional office in Springfield. She earned her Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from Louisiana State University and her Master's in Urban Land Use and Environmental Planning from the University of Kansas. Rhonda began with the department in 2005 and in 2018, the Conservation Commission published her reference manual titled, Conservation Planning Tools for Missouri Communities. To advance the field of community conservation planning, Rhonda serves on the Missouri Chapter Board of the American Planning Association. She also represents the department on the Missouri Prairie Foundation's Grow Native, Grow Native Committee, where she has served as chair since 2019. So without further ado, I would like to turn this presentation over to Rhonda. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I am so happy to be here today to talk to you about conservation planning in municipalities with a focus on case studies sharing urban wetland and waterway projects. As mentioned, um, many of the planning terms that I'll be going over today are included. Let's see if I can advance my slides here. There we go. They are included in the manual that was published back in 2018 called Conservation Planning Tools for Missouri Communities. It is full of definitions and case studies that I compiled and the Conservation Commission published. Um, it is available for a free download. If you go to the URL you see at the bottom of your screen here, you can download a PDF of this manual. Many of the planning concepts I'll review in my talk today can be found here. Today, we've entered into a post-industrial era for how we are managing water and waste in our communities. Historically, in the industrial era, municipalities had separate departments for each specific function of water and waste. So it was common for every town to have their own water supply or drinking supply department, one for sanitation, another for stormwater, another one for streets, and yet another for solid waste management. We are becoming much more integrated in how we plan for and manage both water and waste. And it's because today we are facing um, quite a few issues in which we need to develop some innovative solutions. Some of today's drivers for an integrated planning approach include legacy system issues. And that's really just kind of a, a fancy way of saying that our constructed great infrastructure is aging and it's going to need to be replaced or repaired at some point. We're also facing issues associated with population growth and climate change, but some of our innovative solutions involve green building practices as well as compact growth, uh, development strategies, biophilic cities, and the one water approach. Biophilia refers to a love of nature, and in the context of urban design, that is often exhibited through a mimicking of nature in the built environment. In the example that you see here, which comes to us from Portland, Oregon, this rendering shows a central plaza area surrounded by tall buildings. Now, historically, such a space would have just been a sea of pavement with some scattered benches and scattered trees, but in this biophilic design, they've captured runoff from the buildings and surrounding pavements to pull it into the central courtyard, 
they're mimicking a wetland system by uh, pumping the water through the plaza. They even mimicked a natural spring through the use of those water pumps. This example and others can be found on the LinkedIn page for biophilic design, which you can follow for more examples. I'll show you a photo of the, this um, project once it was constructed. And you can see here that the water, the plants are all um, accessible to people as they walk through this space or set in the provided seating around the perimeter of the plaza. The one water approach is really just a way of saying integrated design and management of all of our water needs in a community. It strives to contribute to a livable city to protect human health and provide flood protection, to minimize environmental pollution, use and reuse natural resources efficiently, be resilient to changes in the climate and economies, all in an effort to provide reliable, secure, clean water. The EPA presented this report you see there on your screen to Congress on integrated plans to comply with the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act of 2019. Of the 13 communities profiled in the report, two of them are from Missouri. One is from the city of Columbia, and the other is the Integrated Plan for the Environment written by the Springfield and Green County Partnership. The Springfield Green County Plan was actually the first in the nation to be submitted to EPA for integrated water planning. We're also in the era of smart cities. These, this is the label being applied when you have an integration of technology with community and nature. The graph on the right side of the screen shows the components of a smart city. If you start with your terrain, you can then layer on buildings, infrastructure, your transportation systems, and then you have your virtual smart city, which collects data from sensors and all of our connected devices. Overlaying that virtual smart city is its digital twin. This is the tool that planners use to conduct scenario plannings. So they take all of the data from the smart city, they run it through scenarios to see how are they equipped to respond to potential natural disasters. And then they're able to tweak their plans so that they are best prepared for their public response in case that those disasters do come to pass. But we're not gonna to get too far into the future with this talk. I'm going to give you quite a few case studies today of urban water and wetland projects that have originated from various types of urban plans. I always start off with the discussion of comprehensive plans because those are the foundational plan for any community. A comp plan is where the community is able to envision the kind of community that they wanna be in the future, in the long term. It's where they're really able to start dreaming about the city that they wanna be in the next 20 years. Sometimes though, projects that are dreamed up in a comprehensive plan are so ambitious that it's really not possible to implement them within a 20 year time frame. That was the case in Springfield, Missouri. Back in the year 2000, they completed the Vision 2020 plan to guide their growth until the year 2020. Within that comp plan, there was an idea. It was called the Jordan Valley Concept. And within this concept plan, they proposed a series of projects that would revitalize Jordan Valley through the center of town, including Jordan Creek that flows through the valley. Well, they were so successful with implementing those project ideas that they wanted to keep the momentum going. So when the comp plan was updated and they now have a plan that will take them through the year 2040, it's called Forward SGF. They included even more projects all in support of that original Jordan Valley concept. So I'm gonna share with you some of the projects. This one has been completed. It was a section of Jordan Creek that had been buried. So the project was to daylight this section of the creek. It had been contained underground in a concrete box culvert. That culvert was demolished. The stream bed was regraded and anchored in place with a flexible concrete blanket. Then the riparian zone was planted with native plants and a greenway trail to promote community interaction with this new space was constructed next to the, to the creek. The term daylighting comes to us from 
the fact that the sunshine can now once again reach the surface of the water, whereas before it could not when it was underground. A different type of project is known as a cultural restoration. This is the case in a section of the creek that's a little downstream from, from the section that was daylighted. Here, the creek is still underground, but the application of cultural restoration is a way of acknowledging, in this case with blue paint that's integrated into the brick crosswalk that goes across the street, it's a way of acknowledging that a precious resource is still there in the community. You just cannot see it because in this case, it happens to be underneath the street, but there is an acknowledgement that the resource exists. This is where it's located. It's just an unseen resource. So this is an example of a cultural restoration. Another project that was completed was for a large area of land that was acquired to become a passive natural park. This project is called Jordan Valley West Meadows. The property was acquired from a railroad company and the city did have um, the challenge of improving what was designated as a brownfield due to historic railroad activities. So they had to clean contaminants. That was one of the reasons for the decision to have this park be a passive natural park instead of a space with a more intensive land use. So the plan was to manage the vegetation as a large meadow. They did construct a greenway trail through the park. The creek here had not been buried. It was still in a more naturalized form, but the city had some stormwater management objectives. Because they had such a large amount of open space in this property, they took advantage of that to construct some wetland pools that would help them retain some excess volume of rainwater runoff on this property and alleviate some downstream flooding. So in this case, when the creek reaches bank full, there is a slight depression made that allows water to flow out of the stream bank, out of the stream bed into these constructed wetland pools. And then once they've reached capacity, water then overflows back into the stream channel. This design team was multidisciplinary. It was a rather large project team. It did contain some landscape architects from Kansas State University. They made this nice rendering here. They also put together the graphic you see here. It shows native plants that have been selected for this project based on where on the site they would perform best and help provide some green infrastructure services to the um, way that this park was managed. So on the graphic, starting on the right side of the screen, you see plants that are designated for use in the riparian corridor, for the pocket wetlands, for the wetter areas of the meadow, and then you move uphill to drier area, areas of the meadow. On the far left of the screen, you do see a couple of columns of flowers that have been organized based on the art element of color. We have purple flowers and yellow flowers, which are complementary colors and therefore are very pleasing to the eye. This is the type of design consideration that landscape architects can bring to a project. So you have all of the, the technical functional aspects of managing the land for your stormwater management objectives, perhaps for wildlife habitat, but the social interactions and the aesthetic attributes of the design are also critical whenever you have a public space such as an urban park. And we're starting to see aesthetic considerations in community conservation projects more often. The landscape architects on the team also put together a vision board to help the community visualize what this project would look like upon completion. And I will say they did a rather nice job of predicting what the final um, meadow landscape would look like with the greenway trail through it and then those constructed wetlands. Now a project that was included in the forward SGF comp plan that has completed its planning stage, it's now in its design phase. 
is called Renew Jordan Creek. This is another project in which the creek has been buried. It currently flows along the southern border of the project area that you see here delineated with the blue line. The city acquired portions of two city blocks in their downtown district, and they plan to renovate this entire property into a new park. So because the project originated in a comp plan, the next step in the process was for the city to form a focus group. Those are usually comprised of citizen volunteers as well as subject matter experts that are invited to participate by the city. So I participated on the focus group for this park. I can take you um, underground now and show you what the stream looks like in its current condition where it is still buried. Here we see Jordan Creek at base flow. We've got a group from my department that is being led on a tour of it by City of Springfield staff. And then when the focus group met, it happened to be during the pandemic. So we were having all of these meetings over Zoom. The design consultants that the city hired from Olson Studio did an excellent job of taking feedback from these Zoom meetings, producing all of the renderings and sketches you see uh, displayed on this slide, coming back to the group and getting additional input, tweaking the design again and again, until they had a final design to present to city council. The group discussed how the park should be programmed. So what sort of activities should be available in this park? What sort of public amenities should be offered? We also discussed how the creek should be treated as well as a planting concept. And I will say I was rather um, pleased that in each of the meetings when we discussed the planting concept, there were people in the focus group that advocated for the use of native plants. And what's more than that, nobody spoke out against that suggestion. So this is showing me that we are now having a real shift in how people view plants in public spaces. No longer is it really desired to have plants there just for their appearance, but we need plants to perform functions for us, to provide those ecosystem services that we can depend on uh, for benefits back to us. We're also looking at plants that help connect us to our natural and cultural heritage, and native plants can accomplish all of those goals. There's a real shift in the expectation also about the appearance of our landscaping in public places. So the design team did present this computer rendering to city council, and there are two two points that I want to um, discuss on this slide about the riparian corridor. One is that the plants recommended by the design team were native plants that would be allowed to grow to their full size and form, so not turf grass being mowed all the way down to the water's edge, but also they recommended that you didn't have open access to the water all the way up and down the bank that instead access was provided at hardened points scattered along the stream. So in this rendering, you can see the little stepping stones that go across the creek. That's a way to not only provide access for people who want to get down close to the water, but also a way to protect the plants on the stream bank so they're not trampled. You wanna maintain the integrity of the plants so that they can keep performing their functions. Okay, the next type of plan that I'm going to discuss is called a development plan. There are all types of development, development guides that are produced, and they can come out of many different departments within a municipal system. The first plan I'm going to show you did, did come out of the Stormwater Services Division of the Department of Public Works in Springfield, Missouri. This is called the Flood Control and Water Quality Protection Manual. It is a stormwater design guide for development in Springfield. This guide is for not only private development, but also public projects. The case study that I'll share with you here 
was conducted along Fast Night Creek, which you can see in the before photo, had been contained in a concrete channel. The proposal was to remove that concrete, and as you can see in the rendering at the top of your screen, the yellow line shows where the concrete channel was, and then the green blob that surrounds it was the proposal to widen the drainage way, plant it with native plants, and then at the far end near the arrowhead to construct some deeper pools that would allow water, a certain volume of water to stay in this stretch of the creek and help alleviate some downstream flooding, which as you can see is a theme of concern with our urban waterways. So the after photo you can see here um, what Fast Night Creek looks like today. The native plants in the riparian corridor are still in their establishment phase, but we're at the end of the project area where those pools were constructed. So you can see some rather still looking water. Those are those series of, of deeper pools within the stream channel. The building you see in the background of the photo here is the Springfield Art Museum. And on a tour of the project, the art director did say that once the plants have become established, their intention is to place some outdoor sculptures down in the corridor. And they're also going to conduct some children's art classes and have art projects down in right alongside the river. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time picturing children doing art projects in the river back when it was still in that concrete channel. But I can definitely imagine what it'd be like to have a whole group of kids down here next to this creek doing some art. A different type of development guide was produced as a joint project between the Departments of Planning and Transportation at the city of Cave Springs in Arkansas. This development guide was the result of a study that came about from the US Fish and Wildlife Services working with the Northwest, Regional, Northwest Arkansas Regional Planning Commission. They conducted a study to identify the recharge zone of some groundwater in which they knew some species of conservation concern lived. Northwest Arkansas has a lot of karst topography. The underground portions of karst where openings um, are formed in the rock and then form caves and systems of tunnels underground allow groundwater to support aquatic wildlife. And um, in some cases in, in caves, there's also terrestrial wildlife and bats. But this study was looking at how the groundwater could be protected that was supporting habitat for a species of concern called the Ozark cave fish. These fish live in groundwater year round. So they have no pigmentation, they're completely white. And in fact, if you look at the logo there on your screen for the city of Cave Springs, I believe those are cave fish on either side of the logo there, those little, little white fish. So the city obviously has an appreciation for that wildlife species. And when the study came out that identified the recharge zone for water that travels from the surface down to the groundwater system where the cave fish live, the city acted on that information and they developed this guide. It's a drainage manual that identifies development practices that will have as less of an, a negative impact as possible on the groundwater habitat within that recharge zone. So the city took the information from this manual and they adopted three ordinances. The first one was to adopt guidelines for development of property within the Cave Springs recharge area. The second ordinance created a karst overlay zone for their zoning map. And the third ordinance officially adopted the criteria in this new drainage manual. Now back in 2002, the Parks and Recreation Department of the City of Columbia in Missouri updated their Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Master Plan. That plan update resulted in this project to create some wetlands known as the 3M Flat Branch Hinkson Creek Wetlands. 
they were dedicated in 2014. They were created to help filter stormwater runoff and provide habitat for wildlife. 17 agency partners came together on this project, which can treat stormwater runoff from approximately 140 acres of urban watershed. The rendering you see on your screen here shows that there are permanent wetland cells that were created in addition to several stormwater detention basins. I also have an image here of the ordinance whereby the city council adopted a resolution declaring the necessity of this project. Just as a reminder that in community conservation projects, we plan out projects based on a natural timeline. So for instance, what are the best months to do your site prep? What are the best months to plant and so forth? But we're also working on a bureaucratic timeline. For municipal or public projects, it may be that there are several steps along the way for different phases of the project that need to be formally approved through adoption of ordinances. You may need city council or your board of aldermen to adopt an ordinance approving the lease of property or approving um, hiring a consultant to work on the project or even approving that the city can enter into an agreement to accept grant funds from another organization. Each time an ordinance is adopted, it may be a multi-month process in which the ordinance is read aloud at a public meeting multiple times. And sometimes these meetings are only scheduled once a month. So just keep in mind as you work on community conservation projects, not only are you working on that natural calendar, but also the bureaucratic calendar as well. Okay, down in Bentonville, Arkansas, um, there was a new park that was being developed called Osage Park. This is not a city owned and operated park, rather a nonprofit organization called the Pill Compton Foundation purchased the land and wanted to create a park that would become in their words, the recreational destination of Bentonville. So in working on the master plan for this park, they realized that there were some wetlands on the property that had been created because of beaver activity. They had to make a decision how they wanted to um, incorporate those wetlands into the park or if maybe they did not want to do that. However, they realized that the wetlands were including habitat to several species of concern, and they did ultimately decide to integrate their new park with the existing wetlands. The park was dedicated in 2020, and since then, visitors have absolutely adored that there is a family of beavers here that have created these wetland systems. They were so beloved, in fact, that a competition was held to name the beaver family, and the ultimate winner was the Van Dams, which is awfully cute. Okay, sometimes projects come about because there is a problem that needs to be solved. That was the case in the city of Jackson, Missouri, down in the southeast part of the state. They were having an issue at Rotary Lake with some nuisance geese. In fact, they counted over 150 Canada geese at this lake. So the Parks Department and the city partnered with the Department of Conservation to develop a lakeshore management plan. Initial site visits assessed the conditions and determined that because of the way the grounds were being managed um, by mowing the grass all the way to the water's edge, that was creating ideal habitat for the geese. The solution was to modify the habitat along the lake shore. So buffers of native aquatic plants were established along approximately 50% of the perimeter of the lake. They were placed along those places that were most favored by the geese. After two years of establishing this buffer of plants, and you can see it's not a wide buffer, but it is tall enough to obstruct the view of the geese from the land to the water and vice versa, making them skittish that perhaps there might be predators hiding behind the tall vegetation. That was so successful that after only two years, they say it is rare now to see even a single goose at this park. 
A similar project was conducted in Springfield by the Springfield Green County Park Board at Lake Drummond. You can see in the photograph on the right, the buffer of taller plants there at the lake shore. The park board here developed some outdoor educational materials. They produced a brochure about the importance of not feeding wildlife, and they installed this outdoor educational sign. They discussed the issue with the nuisance geese and talked about how the native plants along the lake shore are helping them to manage that issue. But not only that, the plants are providing benefits for pollinators and songbirds. This type of outdoor education is a very useful tool in helping to develop a conservation ethic amongst your community. Visitors to the park can learn about their local resources. Once they have more knowledge, they are able to greater appreciate not only the resource, but the management decisions that are being made for how the grounds and the vegetation are being managed in ways that are going to benefit the resource so that the resources can then benefit us. So with that greater appreciation, the resources then can be valued even more. Since I'm talking about birds, I did want to quickly mention a couple of planning tools that help protect bird safety as they travel through our cities and from wetland to wetland. Lighting ordinances and building standards are the tools most commonly used. They are promoted by nonprofit groups such as the American Bird Conservancy and Audubon. Audubon has a program that provides guidelines on lighting practices that help birds see buildings. It's called the Lights Out Program. Around the St. Louis area, there is a group that have adopted this, these guidelines. They're called Lights Out Heartland. I'll give you a couple of case studies from Toronto, Canada and New York. On the left, we see before and after photos of when Toronto adopted some lighting practices to protect bird safety. And then on the right, the bottom photo shows how um, the New York Times building have used a certain type of material on the facade of their building. It addresses not only the window treatments, but also the rest of the building, those horizontal bars. You don't really notice them if you're inside the building looking out, but birds are able to see them and avoid colliding with that building. Hazard mitigation plans are now more often being called resiliency plans. Down in Shelby County, Tennessee, the Office of Resilience did some resiliency planning in response to a series of devastating floods around the Memphis area. But then they went back to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, and requested grant funds to help them write a regional resiliency plan. These issues of being resilient are often better solved at a landscape or a regional scale when you have multiple entities working together. So this includes not only city and county governments, but also the state and any sort of metropolitan or regional planning organization. The resulting Mid-South Regional Resilience Master Plan was published in 2019. And I wanted to point out, um, this page of the appendix, it looks at workforce development potential. So out of all the benefits that we have in mind and all of the objectives for these types of conservation projects in urban areas, one aspect that can't be overlooked is the workforce development potential that these projects will create. They will create jobs, but when you have a job to fill, you need a skilled workforce that can fill those jobs. So this appendix, I, I liked how it was organized. In the left column there, they have recommended types of projects, including in the watershed shed section, we see that it is noted that um, you can protect critical watershed assets, including aquifer recharge and wetlands. Then the graph goes on to show what is the workforce development potential of those types of jobs. And then it also describes what are the skilled trainings 
required so you have that skilled workforce to perform those jobs. And then to conclude my talk, I just wanted to touch on the importance of ongoing research and workforce development. Research is critical so that field staff are able to make scientifically supported management decisions, management recommendations. And then workforce development is critical so that today's students can become tomorrow's conservation professionals. In a joint effort that spans both of these topics, um, there are a couple of initiatives going on in the Springfield, Missouri area that I'd like to share with you. The major players here, in addition to the Missouri Department of Conservation, include the nonprofit organization, Watershed Committee of the Ozarks, and two educational institutions, Missouri State University and the Springfield Public School System. They have a natural resources and environmental college and career pathway for high school students. All of the classes for this pathway program are held at Hillcrest High School. Across the street from Hillcrest High School, the Watershed Committee of the Ozarks has a partnership with the Springfield Public School Systems to have a native plant nursery. This is part of the Watershed Committee's Watershed Natives Program. Students in that environmental college and career pathway are able to get hands-on experience going out to the field and collecting native seed, which then they take back to the nursery, propagate the seed. They're able to learn about how to do that in addition to nursery operations. And then in the spring, a public plant cell is hosted. Um, so the students can learn about that aspect of the nursery trade as well. The, the Missouri Department of Conservation has since entered into an agreement to help support watershed natives establish a second nursery in town. This one is specializing in growing woody species in a new type of bed called a Missouri gravel bar bed. They're also specializing in growing native aquatic plants, which in Missouri can be harder to find in the, in the existing retail nursery trade than more upland species. So this new nursery should be able to um, help even more projects um, to be planted that involve aquatic resources down in the Southwest Missouri area. So some of the research that we are looking at, we've been discussing with professors from Missouri State University, involve determining if there are benefits of native aquatic plant species to both water quality and wildlife habitat. So to prepare for these kinds of studies, the department has been um, expanding the amount of aquatic plants that we are planting along the shorelines of conservation area ponds and lakes. You can see one of those um, uh, planting um, enclosures on the bottom right of your screen there. Those plants do have to be protected from all the wildlife that would like to eat them while they become established. We're also experimenting with different types of floating wetland systems, including the floating island from a company called Biohaven. You see on your screen there on the left. It's been retrofitted with a cage, again, to protect those native aquatic plant species um, from wildlife that would like to eat them. We're hoping that we can put together a do-it-yourself guide for communities of any size to walk them through step-by-step -step where do you purchase aquatic plants? How do you establish them and get them growing? And then once they're growing, you know, why did you do all that effort? It's because hopefully our research will show that there are benefits to water quality and wildlife habitat that these communities can realize from implementing these types of projects. In order to determine wildlife use of these um, new aquatic materials and the floating wetlands, we did have an AquaView video taken. You can see that video, uh, screenshot of that video in the upper right of your screen. This video was shot four weeks after that floating island was installed at one of our conservation area ponds. 
So you can see the fish there interacting with the roots that have grown through the floating island down into the water. Now, once um, students have gone through workforce development or conducted research, and they decide they are interested in, in a job that works with native plants, what types of jobs are going to be available to them? This document, which can be downloaded from the URL you see at the bottom of your screen, profiles 31 different jobs that work with native plants. Those jobs are divided into 11 different career paths. The document was compiled by the Grow Native Program of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. The, job, the jobs are all described in terms of their job duties, as well as the educational requirements needed to make a person eligible to be hired into that type of job. The document also profiles 23 different professional associations with certification programs. These are additional credentials someone can earn to supplement their formal education and make them even more attractive to potential employers. Now, speaking of certification programs, the Grow Native program did also create their own certification. They rolled this program out in late 2022. You can find out more about it if you go to the URL at the bottom of your screen. This program, it certifies that those who pass a test have a baseline knowledge of what it takes to work with native plants in developed areas. I do believe this program will be a game changer for communities that struggle to hire people with the right type of skills um, and knowledge to be able to not only design effectively with native plants, but know how to appropriately install them, whether it's in a uh, natural setting, whether the plants are being used to create a wildlife habitat, or being used for a different type of green infrastructure, such as a stormwater management project, the plants need to be properly installed. And then critically, they need to be appropriately maintained in the long run so that they maintain their functionality. So by being able to hire either staff or consultants or contractors that have their Grow Native professional certification, a community can be assured that they are hiring people who have the right kind of specialized skills that are needed to work on these types of projects. Okay, that is all I have for you today. I appreciate the opportunity to present and I can answer any questions if there are any. Okay. Thank you so much, Rhonda. We really appreciated that. And um, we'll get to the question and answers. Uh, uh, once again, uh, please post your questions that you have in the question and answer uh, box. And I will pose your questions to Rhonda. And if you um, don't have a chance, if there's not enough time to have your answer during this uh, session, then um, please make a note of, of Rhonda's email address and, and feel free to send any questions to her there. Um, starting off, um, actually, you know, there was one uh, question, it's not at the top of the list, but um, the question is, can the links mentioned in the webinar be entered in the chat so we can copy and paste? And the um, usually the slide deck from the webinar is included with the um, where with the video when it's posted on YouTube, so anyone who's who's uh, who has um, attended should be able to uh, basically obtain those links from from the slide deck once it's posted. And um, so, Rhonda, what documents are available on conservation planning? that we can access to further our education in the area? Okay, I think the best way for me to answer that is if you download that conservation planning tools manual, you can look in the back at the work cited and whatever particular area of community conservation interests you most, 
you will be able to find a resource that will hopefully send you down a rabbit hole of lots and lots of good uh, reference materials. But when I was um, doing research to compile that manual, I came to a point where I just had to stop doing research because there's so many wonderful resources out there that I just, at some point I had to put a pin in it and just say, okay, enough. These are the references I'm going with for the manual. I know there's other good ones out there, but I, I can't include them all. Um, but that is a really good starting point for you. Um, yeah, I, I would say just start with the work cited of the manual. Okay, so you've heard from an expert. There's a rep <laughs> on the subject. Um, the uh, Another question, do you have recommendations for the best ways to engage internal stakeholders for some of these natural resource projects? How do we get citizens, park departments, sewer departments, streets department engaged in all the same page, all on the same page for an urban wetland restoration? Oh, well, so the easiest way to get everybody engaged and excited, I would say for an urban wetland would be first to familiarize yourself um, with what they've already said that they are interested in, in their community. So if you haven't looked through their comprehensive plan, do that because that's gonna tell you, that's gonna give you um, an in to say, hey, you, you mentioned in your comp plan, you're interested in outdoor recreation. Well, let me show you how an urban wetland can provide those opportunities. Or if they have a parks master plan, if they have you know, any of the plans like I reviewed today, review those plans and find ways that you can meet their stated goals and objectives with an urban wetland and offer that up as a solution. And then of course, um, once you get them excited about that being the way that they, they should go, you might need to help them um, identify funding sources, um, how they can actually um, implement that project. But, you know, it's, it doesn't take, it doesn't take a big grant to start the conversation and to show them like, hey, you know, I'm familiar with your community. I know what you guys are interested in. Um, I know you're having issues with stormwater management, or I know that, you know, you have an expressed desire to, um, you know, enhance your local uh, bird watching opportunities. Whatever it is that they want, I think you can find a way that an urban wetland would help to uh, to meet those goals and and sell it that way. Yeah, and. Heck, I'm, and, and once you sell, once you once you sold your your uh, your pro, your plan or your mm -hmm. your concept to the, I should say the the property owner, if uh, for lack of better words, you know, to the city, to the municipalities, or or whatever, you know, I mean, they're gonna have they're gonna have like a big job, you know, with all the design and build and permitting and mm -hmm. everything, and 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 it, there's a point where things. People come together because everybody has a job they have to do to make these things work. Now, I mean, my gosh, and so um, anyway, I, I, I'm thinking the sales pitch is probably the, the hardest part. Maybe not. I don't know. I've never pitched it, but um, <laughs> I have another question. Um, some of these projects appear to be very successful. Have some of those projects won any awards or certifications? Oh yes, I'm I'm sure they have. Um, sometimes you know, the projects that are complete failures make the best case studies. And, and sometimes I do talk about those. I, I do believe all the projects I shared with you today though were success stories. Um, but, you know, around, around uh, Southwest Missouri where, where I do most of my work, people are, they, they tend to be pretty humble and not really go after a lot of awards or recognition. Um, you really have to, uh, what I have found that works um, with my with my work with the American Planning Association, the Missouri chapter of, of that association, is you almost have to, in cases, stand up a nomination committee and task those people with nominating projects that have been completed 
because the people who worked on the projects, they, they, they would never nominate themselves. But if you have um, people who weren't, you know, involved in the project, but they recognize it as being award worthy, and you task them with the, um, the job of submitting those nominations for awards, that can be a successful way to get recognition for these projects. And we've, we've had success with that in Missouri. But yes, um, there are a lot of successful projects here. And if you are from out of state um, or out of country, then it would be worthwhile to come to Missouri. And even, even if you just come to Springfield, Missouri and take a tour of some of our spaces, um, everyone here is, incredibly good at working together and coordinating. We give tours all the time. So please come and we'll show you around. I've got a sister in St. Louis. Maybe I'll drop by when I want to visit sometime. Yes. <laughs> so um, oh, we do have a question. Um, this is a general question to the, the committee. Will we get something noting our attendance for uh, PWS renewal? And yes, uh, you will get a certi certificate of attendance at the end of the webinar, we'll have a, a survey for you to fill out, and and um, when you submit, that will get the, the process rolling. Is there, an, is there an ability to incorporate mitigation projects to supplement funding and contractors for these projects, then dedicate to the municipality to maintain long term? Mm. You know, um, I... So I was recently appointed to the Missouri Department of Conservation's Wetland Working Group. And one of the first questions that I asked that committee was about wetland mitigation banks. And, you know, if, if we could have more of them in the state or, you know, that just really, uh, I, I was interested in that topic. And people who know a lot more about it than I do, um, express that there's there's quite a few guidelines that that you have to follow in the world of mitigation banking. So I don't know how easy it would be to um, have an area designated as a receiving zone and enhance a wetland and then donate it to a municipality. I really don't know if that's even feasible or, or possible to do, but I love the idea of it. I think it's worthwhile to look into. And if there's a situation where you can have outside funds come in to create or enhance an urban wetland in your community, then I'd say try to make it happen. I just, I know it's a it's a complex topic that I just don't know the ins and outs of. And you know, um, I'm not an expert on the on the process myself, but the the agency that agency that I work for, Florida, it's one of the five water management districts, actually um, manages projects that are that are funded that you know we receive funding from the state for that are you know you basically that are that are grant fund. It's a grant funded, um, I guess, opportunity where um, we have we have a lot of municipalities and private entities that you know with projects they can if they have if they have a conceptual project like a, a wetland mitigation project or or perhaps even you know a stormwater master master plan with the creation of of, of any type of wetland mitigation uh, money's available through grant funding there so uh, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of uh, you know I'm, I'm sure other states have their their programs but but um, you know that's that's kind of where where we start here in in Florida. Yes, uh, and if you're searching for funding, I I will promote um, public libraries. There there is a program of that I do believe is available in every single state, and you could search the um, there are repositories or databases that include all of the funders that have that offer grants. So government agencies, private foundations, there is certain public libraries are designated as repositories for funding databases. If you can find one and go to it, 
reference librarians will provide you training on how to use these databases and you can find funding for every project under the sun. You cannot think of a kind of project that you wouldn't be able to match a grant to. So the money is out there. Um, you might need to do some research to find the programs that match your project. But the secret is you find a program that wants to fund exactly your kind of project, and then you have a very competitive chance of receiving grant funds. Um, now, the application process can be arduous. The paperwork requirement can be cumbersome. So you might need to put in a lot of work for that money, but the money is out there. Another resource for you, and this is three, free through the American Planning Association. They have created a, a water network. It's free to join and you don't have to be a member of APA to join it. All you need to do is email water at planning.org and you will have access then to newsletters and webinars. Very good. Okay, we're gonna wrap up questions here in a minute. Let me let me pull one more out. Here's This is an interesting one. Uh, joining from Vermont, where we had catastrophic fl flooding mid-July, including our capital, Mont Montpelier, any recommendations for working with communities in the throes of recovery? Oh man, that's that's such a um, stressful time for communities. Yeah. Oh, back in I want to say it was maybe 2011, a catastrophic tornado went through Joplin, Missouri, and some of the response efforts included folks that came over from. Um, Oh, I hope I get the name of the town right. Greensboro, Kansas, which had also sustained major catastrophic damage from a tornado. And when they rebuilt, they committed, the entire community committed to rebuilding in a green fashion. So a group from that community came to Joplin, Missouri, and basically did a lot of hand holdings, but they formed an ad hoc group that met um, you know, pretty frequently at first, and then, you know, started meeting less frequently. But it was for a way for community members and subject matter experts to meet and just talk about what are some of the um, strategies for rebuilding in a green friendly manner? You know, what are what are some of the ways that you can incorporate conservation practices into your new um, open spaces and public land? what are green building materials that can be used. And essentially it was just a way for uh, community members and businesses that were facing the task of rebuilding to have a forum that they could talk and ask questions to people who'd been there, they'd been through a disaster, but also people who were experts in development and construction and could provide them with answers to their questions and inspiration for how to build back greener than they had been. So that's a really um, a really good way, you know, of having sort of a, a non-governmental response. But you can also look at, to your professional associations, you know, such as the Society for Wetland Scientists, or reach out to your local chapter of the American Institute of Architects or the American Society of Landscape Architects. Um, all sorts of professional associations have members that would be willing to, you know, attend a meeting or provide information and guidance um, in that situation where you've gone through that, that catastrophe or that um, natural disaster, and you're just scrambling for resources and information. So I, I would say that I would say be open to um, others coming into the community that have a valid, you know, reason for being there. They're there to help and host community meetings. But also, I absolutely recommend reaching out to professional associations and seeing if there's anything they can do. In fact, AIA did go to Joplin after the tornado, and they hosted a design charrette for community leaders and residents to reimagine how they could build back. 
Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you very much. Uh, with um, with that, we we're we gonna have to wrap up the or end the Q and A. And I just wanted to remind everyone. I'm sorry, I muted myself. Uh, please visit the websites of our sponsors: BioApp, Cattails Environmental LLC, Baby Mitigation, and Ducks Unlimited. And also, our next Spanish language webinar will be on September 13th. And then we'll be gathering on September 21st for our next English language webinar on wetland mitigation and the art of creating water budget, a water budget. Please do not forget to register. Register. Um, please check out our website and social media channels to learn more and register, up, register for upcoming events. And don't forget to complete the survey that will be sent to you after this webinar to receive a certificate of participation and provide feedback on this webinar series. Thanks again. And thank you very much, Rhonda. You, this is a very pretty presentation as well. And um, thank you for everyone for attending, taking time today to enjoy this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.